Good day everyone, Dr. Polaris here. Today we will be examining a couple of Eocene North American fossil sites to give a better impression of what life was like at this time. We will be starting with the animals of the Reeves bone bed from the late Eocene of Texas, 37 to 33 million years ago. I will give you a few case studies from each and if you would like to know more detailed information on each of these fossil sites, then please feel free to visit my DeviantArt page. Now, let us begin with number one, Segnonix procerus. The first of the truly massive and bulky Nothrosaurids, Segnonix stood an estimated 3.7 meters tall and weighed roughly 1,100 kilograms. Despite strongly resembling a therizinosaur, Segnonix and other Nothrosaurids were actually highly aberrant herbivorous descendants of Troodontids that survived the end Maastrichtian extinction event. Finding themselves in a world without competition from Therizinosaurs, these animals moved into the vacated niche of slow-moving high browsers. Segnonix was a significantly more derived animal than its much smaller late Paleocene relative Phytodontosaurus, from which it probably evolved. For one thing, Segnonix has undergone a significant degree of tooth loss, possessing only a small number of teeth at the very tips of its jaw. Its tail is highly reduced in length, its pubis has swept backwards, and its hips have widened to accommodate a voluminous belly, as well as giving this animal the ability to sit on its haunches while feeding. The only outwardly visible markers of its troodontid ancestry are the well-developed pernacious feathers clothing its powerful elongated forelimbs. Segnonix spent its days browsing from the abundant foliage of the dense forests that covered most of North America at this time, using its sharp claws and muscular forelimbs to defend itself against predators. Number two, Breviceratus cottonwoodensis. This lean, sprightly animal is Breviceratus, the first known member of the long-lived and successful Ziphosaurids. In the modern world, large herds of these cursorial, plains-dwelling herbivores can be found on all continents except for Australia and Antarctica. However, their origins lay in the hot, steamy forests of Eocene North America. Unlike modern members of its lineage, Breviceratus was a rather small, unassuming creature. Measuring just three metres in length and lacking the extensive cranial ornamentation present in today's Ziphosaurids, Breviceratus was nonetheless highly effective at escaping potential predators, such as the Boreoraptorian dromaeosaurs, by utilising a rapid turn of speed. Indeed, velocity appears to have been a family trait in these animals from the very beginning, Ziphoceratids appear to be close relatives of the rhododromids, forming a sister group with them in most phylogenetic analyses, and maybe even evolving from among them. The former can be differentiated from the latter by a number of traits, including proportionally longer hind limbs, atrophied forelimbs, a longer, vaguely lambiosaurine-like rostrum, and the possession of a horn formed from a projection of the frontal and postorbital bones of the skull. What really set Ziphosaurids apart from other small ornithischians were their teeth. Breviceratus already possessed a high tooth count when compared to Rhododromids, which seemed to have been suited for handling tough vegetation. In later Ziphosaurids, particularly the modern Ziphosaurian subfamily that originated in the late Oligocene, these teeth had developed into chopping batteries of up to 800 tiny scalpel-like blades. After the late Eocene, Ziphosaurids became confined to Eurasia and would not return to their American homeland until the late Miocene roughly 6 million years ago. The reasons for their extinction in North America are poorly understood, but competition from the outwardly similar but unrelated Presidio serratids may be to blame. Number 3. Dynamotyrannus imperiosus. During the Paleocene, Tyrannosaurids were the unquestioned lords of the apex predator niche in Laurasia. Although strangely absent from Europe, in Asia and North America the descendants of T. rex were a resounding success story. Little changed from their Cretaceous ancestors. 
imposing 12 meter long beer moths like Dynamo Tyrannus spent their days lurking on the edges of the thick tropical forest that covered Eocene Wyoming. While juveniles were highly cursorial, slender pursuit predators, Fully grown adults could only muster a brief but explosively powerful sprint in the direction of their preferred prey, weak or injured hadrosaurs and ceratopsians. If the unfortunate prey item could not escape, it would be dispatched by a tremendously brutal bite to the neck or flanks. In fact, Cenozoic Tyrannosaurids possessed even more powerful jaws than their Cretaceous forebears, while at the same time developing stockier and thicker hind limbs. Studies have confirmed that Dynamo Tyrannus was slower than T-Rex, with an ultimate top speed of around 20 miles an hour and an overall weight of roughly 7.5 tons. The reasons for these evolutionary developments seem to be tied to the spread of dense tropical forests during the Paleogene. With the increased ground cover, coupled with teeming herds of potential prey roaming the landscape, Tyrannosaurs simply had an easier time ambushing their next meal, and could afford to pack on the pounds at the expense of a little speed. When conditions began to change during the late Eocene in Asia, this would spell disaster for that continent's Tyrannosaurids, who would end up disappearing there along with the Hadrosaurs and Ceratopsids. In North America, however, Tyrannosaurids managed to cling on up until the end of the early Miocene. The individual above seems to be attempting to remove a piece of stringy hadrosaur flesh from her teeth without much success. Finally, to represent the late Eocene, let us examine the Reeves bone bed of Presidio County, Texas, USA. Number 1. Nodontoraptor australis. This furtive little creature is Nodontoraptor. Dwelling in the subtropical open forests of late Eocene, Texas, Nodontoraptor was named for one surprising anatomical feature, a completely toothless beak. While the rest of the skeleton seems to have been rather typical for a small troodontid, the development of a beak was a novel and very important evolutionary step. In time, descendants of animals like Nodontoraptor would blossom into the species and highly morphologically diverse Rhynchorostra clade, Indeed, modern members of this clade run the gamut from high-browsing herbivores, eagle-like terrestrial carnivores, and the premier group of grazers in the Northern Hemisphere. In the late Eocene, however, the most basal rhynchorostrans, like Nodontoraptor, were small, generalised omnivores, feeding on fruit, leaves, and small animals. Known from only one fragmentary specimen recovered from the late Eocene Reeves bone bed, consisting of only the forequarters without the hind limbs or tail, Nodontoraptor possessed large, forward-facing eyes. This suggests a nocturnal or crepuscular lifestyle. If you were to catch a glimpse of this small, shy creature, there would be no indication that it would go on to produce an extremely diverse array of descendants. Number 2. Buccina rhinus complexus we are all familiar with the two late Cretaceous hadrosaurid subfamilies, Saurolophinae and Lambiosaurinae. Both of these lineages survived into the Paleogene, and begat a whole host of descendants before going extinct at the Eocene Oligocene boundary. In North America, at least, the most important and long-lasting of these were the Canolophines. Although their phylogenetic position is unclear, it, is, it has been suggested that they were derived from Saurolophine ancestors, and are frequently in the clade Saurolophoidea. Members of this lineage are endemic to North America from the Middle Eocene until their eventual extinction during the Late Miocene. While extremely common and diverse animals during the Oligocene and Early Miocene, Canolophines first appeared as small, rare animals during the Eocene. Buccina rhinus was an early member of this group and displays two of the most definitive characteristics of Canolophinae a highly complex nasal anatomy and a backward curving head crest. It has been assumed by paleontologists that Canolophines used their highly derived nasal structure to amplify their calls, possibly through the use of a brightly coloured inflatable skin flap. Buccina rhinus was a rare animal in an environment dominated by Saurolophine hadrosaurs and ceratopsids. It is known from two specimens from the Reeves bone bed one of which was roughly 60% complete. 
The second specimen consisted of a partial upper maxilla with the nasal structure thankfully well preserved. The whole animal reached a length of six to seven meters as an adult. Number three, Brontoceratops imperator. By the early Eocene, the great Chasmosaurian ceratopsians of North America were extinct. For the remainder of the period, however, their Uinterceratopsian relatives simply stepped into the niches left by their more ancient cousins. This group of ceratopsids were defined by elongated brow horns, comparatively short neck frills, and stubby nasal horns. Huge herds of these animals roamed across North America and Eurasia, their remains uncovered in vast bone beds comprising dozens of individuals of varying ages. By the end of the Eocene, some Uinterceratopsians had grown to enormous sizes and appear to have been moving into an almost sauropod-like mode of existence. Indeed, the largest and last North American member of this group, Brontoceratops imperator, measured up to 15 metres long and weighed in excess of 13 tonnes. This massive animal possessed some anatomical features that were quite atypical for ceratopsids. For one thing, its skull was unusually small in comparison to the size of its body. This, combined with a long neck and upright stance, has led paleontologists to suggest a browsing niche for this genus. Interestingly, while its smaller relatives were clearly herding animals, Brontoceratops specimens have always been found singly. This is likely not due to taphonomic bias, as this genus was actually rather common, making up 20% of the dinosaur fauna at some sites. It is therefore probable that these beasts lived a solitary existence, only coming together to mate. As North America was devoid of sauropods at this time, both Brontoceratops and Lambiosaurine hadrosaurs exploited the high browser niche unopposed. However, when environmental conditions began to change at the Eocene or Ligocene boundary, Brontoceratops, and all other ceratopsids for that matter, became extinct. Their leptoceratopsid relatives were waiting in the wings, however, biding their time. Thank you for listening, everyone. Next week, I'll be detailing the strange case of the Unguma Manini, a rather bizarre Congolese prehistoric cryptid. I hope to see you again soon. Cheerio.